Hi, I'm Derek Elin, and here is your video mini lecture thing for uh, review or absence uh, involving set three, balance and unity in scene mode. And these are continuing scene modes. Um, they're a little more specific, and some of them are a little more digital uh, as opposed to mechanical. In other words, it's like the camera's computer processing it a certain way as opposed to the internal workings of the camera moving around differently. Um, so with set three, you're going to take four photos. Um, those photos, and we'll kind of do the, um, the composition stuff first and then the technique stuff so you can see what the modes are. Um, composition has to do with balance and unity. Um, balance is kind of like left over from the rule of thirds, which, if you recall, uh, was all about getting you to push things off balance a little bit. Um, so first of all, that has to do with balance, but... Um, one of the first pictures you're going to take uh, here involves uh, taking a picture in a low lighting condition, which um, there's no rule about this, but it might um, imply uh, sort of like a gentleness or a quietness that might be interesting uh, to push if you go for symmetry. Uh, so whereas the rule of thirds, you're going for asymmetry, uh, you're going to take a photo in a low lighting condition. Uh, where you're going for symmetry, you know, either equal on both sides or um, a clear centered subject. Um, balance will then kind of bleed into unity. Um, a couple simple things about unity. First of all, unity means the entire uh, composition locks together. Uh, nothing feels out of place. Everything belongs. Nothing is isolated. And anything that happens, happens elsewhere. There's an echo of anything that you see happening somewhere else in the frame. Um, a really good example of that is my lower back tattoo here. Um, just kidding. Uh, but uh, the yin yang, uh, well, you have this huge chunk of black here and you have this huge chunk of white here, but then there's like a little dollop of white in the black. There's a little dollop of black in the white. And if I go in here and make that, whoops, I'll pass these down. If I go in here and I change that, um, all of a sudden it doesn't feel quite so unified. Um, it feels separate, isolated, like the two halves don't really have much of anything to do with one another. Um, a more complex uh, example that you'll see a lot in art classes is Starry Night. And that's because, uh, again, in Starry Night, anything that happens happens elsewhere. So you might glance at it and you might think, oh, no, wait a second, there's this reddish brown that's happening in this structure here. But then it, that does pop up, or at least similarities pop up elsewhere. Um, oh gosh, right here, the moon is like really bright yellow, but then that bright yellow, even though it's not as strong as it is here, does pop up elsewhere. So everything that happens is kind of interworked and interspersed throughout. Um, if I go in and I say, how about bright pink? Um, I want some bright pink on this, and I want it right here. Um, then all of a sudden that bright pink beacon becomes difficult to look away from. You try to look over here at this nice gentle light in the sky and this pink monster is over here screaming for your attention. Um, and that's going to keep happening until I start adding some pink accents and defiling this um, classical masterwork even further. Um, but uh, even though I've totally ruined Starry Night... Um, it is now easier to look away from this pink blob because it doesn't seem like it's just like a distraction or something that's out of place. Um, so um, sometimes um, unity can happen in um, very intentional ways. Um, so we've got some pictures here that have to do with negative space. Um, and in every case, uh, unity is happening just between black and white um, because the whites and the blacks interlock in interesting ways. Um, it's not just all, again, similar to the yin-yang, a little bit different, um, but the way these darks and lights interlock um, becomes interesting and makes the whole thing feel like it fits together. Uh, you see that happening here. You see that happening here. Um, even despite the broad range of grays that are in this picture, there is black, there is white, there is gray just everywhere, all over the place. Um, there's nothing that feels stuck or isolated. Um, sometimes that kind of thing happens less intentionally, or um, sometimes there's a happy accident. You kind of get better at seeing this kind of thing the more pictures you take. Um, 
So here we have a virgin margarita, completely alcohol-free. Um, and we have this orange up here. And the orange is what color? It's orange. Um, and then we have some, you know, kind of yellowish orange. Again, it's not the exact same color, but it definitely serves as an echo over here. Um, and then we have a blue background. And you might start to look at this and you might kind of think, well, the blue is really, it's happening here and it's happening here. And that does take up probably enough of the frame uh, that it would still count as unified. But one thing you might notice is if you look at the salt and you think about what color the salt is. Um, and this is true of painting, where a painter needs to learn to um, observe differences from, observe the ways in which colors differ from their local color. We all would think of salt as being maybe white, maybe clear. We wouldn't think of it as being blue. But when it's in this bright blue environment, the salt, especially down in here, starts to kind of like pick up some of those blue tones because it's like crystalline and reflective. Um, so um, that blue is evident in the salt, which means this could be maybe cropped a little differently and maybe more extremely, but still achieve unity because of that blue echoing uh, within that. Um, so... Um, Balance and unity, you know, again, balance is, again, kind of a holdover from rule of thirds. Unity is probably review. Um, sometimes with unity, you're achieving it um, similar to simplicity and emphasis by simply, like, closing in on things, um, cropping, changing angle, eliminating the big, ugly, pink distraction. I got to get that off of there. It's going to drive me crazy. Uh, so... Um, that uh, pretty much covers the uh, composition. Um, if we look at what we're going to be doing here, you're going to be taking four photos. Um, one of them is going to be symmetrically balanced using night scene, so in a low lighting condition. I'll come back to that. Um, the other two, uh, second and third ones, are going to have to do with color unity and value unity, which you can think of value unity as being like the blacks and whites. Um, even though your photo might not actually be black and white, you're looking at it in terms of dark and light. Or you could even switch your camera over or you know, add a black and white filter or whatever. Um, but you're making sure that all of the darks and lights interlock. Um, the same is true of color. You could have this like color version of the yin yang um, where any color that's happening is happening elsewhere and nothing feels out of place or isolated. Um, the fourth one is kind of a catch-all, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the composition is a little less important with that one. Um, it is important that you do take a picture of something specific or in a specific way to fit whatever mode you're picking. Okay, um, the first of your four uh, settings is going to be uh, night scene. Um, and there are generally two different kinds of night scenes. The kind that is meant to involve the flash and the kind that's not. Um, so a flash night scene, um, what it's going to do is it's going to fire the flash. Um, if possible, it's going to direct the flash toward the subject or um, not fire it super intensely. Um, and then uh, as it fires the flash, it is also doing a slightly slower shutter speed, um, which means um, it is getting like a crystal clear picture of a frontal subject. Um, but then it's also got enough time uh, for whatever's in the background to show up. Otherwise, you could imagine this picture being taken with like auto mode with the flash on and having it just be a flash photograph of this woman with like just blackness behind her. Um, if possible, if you only have a mode that uses uh, the flash with a low lighting condition, then you can use that. If possible, you want to maybe try one that doesn't, which is purely going to be a slow shutter speed. Um, so this is kind of the reverse of Kids Pet Sports Action in the sense that with Kids Pet Sports Action, you had to go outside in broad daylight. With Night Scene, you want to be inside in a dark lighting situation. I would just suggest being in the classroom uh, and turning off the lights. Um, and then you're going to have to use a tripod, uh, some way of having the camera be perfectly still. I'll have tripods set up in the room that you can use. Um, there is also, um, you know, if you're needing this at home, um, you can stack up books and duct tape them together and, you know, tape your camera to the books in some way that doesn't damage it. Um, your tripod doesn't have to be fancy is what I'm getting at. It can be something that you cobble together as long as it keeps the camera still and the camera is pointing where you want it to point. 
Um, there's also the poor man's tripod, which is where you just you don't even worry about anchoring your camera. You just put it down on something um, and make sure it's pointed toward what you want it to point. Even if it's a bit precariously balanced, you put the 10 second timer on your camera and then you hit the button and then you get the heck away from it. And any rocking that it's still doing should kind of calm down by the time it actually clicks, um, creating a perfectly still image. Um, so. Um, you're going to take a night scene picture uh, with symmetrical balance. So again, sort of similar to like this situation. Um, it's meant to feel you're experimenting with being intentionally, uh, intentionally avoiding the rule of thirds and, and keeping things still and calm. Um, for color and value unity, you're going to have some choices to what modes you want. You have, um, for color, you know, the indoor or foliage mode. Um, depending on the camera, you might have either or neither of these. Sometimes it'll be called color boost mode. Um, sometimes it'll be called vivid or super vivid. Um, at any rate, cameras uh, that have these kinds of modes will often have uh, modes that are meant to boost color in some way. Um, indoor, what indoor tends to do, and I don't, think I have an example, um, but it kind of just accounts for the fact that people tend to have poor taste in lighting and they'll have like harsh white fluorescent light. So um, indoor, excuse me, will boost the color a little bit, but it also tend to warm it up. Um, whereas foliage, uh, here we see an example uh, of actual foliage. Foliage is just like plants. Um, foliage will tend to take like reds and greens, you know, plant-like colors um, and boost those colors. And then sometimes leave other colors like blue uh, that you're less likely to find in like plants and nature. Um, sometimes it'll kind of leave those alone. Um, so um, it that depends on entirely on the device. But um, you should find that you're boosting color, which in that case probably makes it even more important that you're achieving unity of color. Um, Value unity, you're going to use either snow or beach. A lot of people worry about, like, do I need snow or sand? What if it's not snowing and we're nowhere near a beach? You don't. You just need a lot of white um, for that one to really see what it does. Um, if you've ever, uh, let's say, they call off school and you go outside and it's a beautiful snowy day and you are so inspired by this vision of beauty that's not only beautiful because it's just so natural and sparkly, but also because it got you out of school, um, you want to take a photograph of it. And when you take that photograph, you're disappointed because photography never captures the actual beauty of nature. Uh, it's an imitation. Um, but part of the problem is probably that the snow is so bright white that it just washed everything out. It just became a field of paper white with none of those sparkly details or shadows or anything that you see that actually allows you to imagine the texture of the snow. Um, what snow mode will do and beach mode is similar, um, just a little less intense, is it essentially kind of jumps the exposure down a little bit, um, especially in the brighter areas. Um, it's going to look into those areas and allow you to see more detail uh, than you otherwise would. And same thing for beach. Uh, finally, we have any other mode, and there's a little blank there, and then any subject, whatever that mode is for. And then this does warn you, and I do want you to do a fourth uh, photograph here, but it says this should be a mode you haven't tried already, um, and you should use it for whatever it is intended for. And I'll also say, don't pick a mode that's stupid. You know, use this as an opportunity to experiment. You're not going to learn anything from just trying something in auto mode. You need to be able to see the difference um, when you do this mode, um, and sometimes that does again involve some research as to what it's meant to be used for. Um, so whether using the class camera as your own camera, um, whether, you know, in some cases it might not be a mode, it could be filtering after the fact. Um, but just real quick, I'm going to, um, go through some, uh, things that you may or may not have. Um, one would be an aquarium mode, which aquarium modes, in my opinion, aren't very good. Um, they tend to want to digitally mimic the effect of a CPL filter. Um, a CPL filter is a filter that you can get for like a DSLR and you stick it on the front of the lens and it keeps turning even after you screw it on. Um, and it allows you to, it stands for circular polarizing lens. So it will actually like filter out um, you know, certain aspects of light. Like for instance, without CPL, you're seeing the water here, you're getting a lot of like reflection and glare. Uh, with the CPL, not only does it kind of balance the sky and the ground a little bit better, but it also lets you see directly into the water. So especially nature photographers um, are going to want to own uh, one of those. 
Um, but uh, if you don't have one of those, um, our class DSLR has one uh, that you can try if you want to. Um, or you may have an aquarium mode, and you may or may not see it doing much of anything to mimic the feeling of a CPL. Um, there is fisheye mode, which is often just like a digital distortion, um, but fisheye is, of course, a lens that you can get. Um, there is often a um, miniature effect, um, which is meant to mimic uh, a tilt shift lens. Um, I'm not going to get into what that is right now, but if you look at this, it just looks like it's like some train set. It's like little toy cars and toy people, and it's not. This is a real photograph. Um, the reason that you might not believe me um, is because it's hard to conceive of real life being seen this way um, because this looks a lot more like a macro shot. Um, and um, whether it's doing optically with a tilt shift lens uh, or digitally with this like effect or filter on it, um, it's just essentially blurring the top and bottom um, so as to mimic the idea of like a really, really close, really narrow um, depth of field. So it looks like you're looking at something up close. Um, and then finally, we have Panorama, which you're probably familiar with if you have a, like an iPhone. Um, some freestanding cameras have them too. Um, you're welcome to try that. Uh, you're also welcome to try um, intentionally messing up the Panorama. Um, if you've ever like done like a Google image search for Panorama fail, I'll just do it real quick. Um, it's where like something gets like distorted or mutated or just looks crazy. Um, you see a few instances of this um, where as the panorama scanned, something changed um, and it like captured uh, a weird combination of things. Um, so that could be uh, something fun to uh, play with. Uh, and then finally, and there could be any, you know, number of other modes, filters, effects, and other things. Uh, finally, we have toy camera mode. Uh, a toy camera is a kind of camera that um, is made of plastic and tends to be called a toy camera just because it's intentionally cheaply made. Um, and the cheap, bad manufacturing process uh, has a tendency to allow light to leak in uh, to the seams, which is what creates these vignettes. Um, it's a kind of film camera. Um, and the way they work with their, you know, crummy plastic lens and and crummy plastic construction is um, they tend to like desaturate light, create distortions um, and have this kind of eerie vignette. Um, so this again is, it's a digital effect as opposed to authentic. We actually have toy cameras, um, which, you know, I've, I've had people do as like their final project in advanced digital arts. They play with the toy camera and get some shots to work and actually use the dark room again. Um, so something for the future if you're interested. Um, otherwise, again, as always, let me know if you have questions on any of these uh, four photographs. Um, and once you've taken them, um, you can move on to set four. Good luck.